Um, but basically, I have 30 minutes to tell you what I know about female athlete triad and try to hit some of the highlights. Um, I have no disclosures. So basically, athleticism um, in young women um, has many beneficial effects. We know this. We know that it increases self-esteem. Typically, um, athletes have more positive body images. They have increased likelihood of academic success, um, usually decreased risky behaviors. And we know that usually athletes have a higher bone mineral density than non-athletes because of all that great weight bearing that they're doing on their bones. Um, and it's typically somewhere about 15%, but it can be up to 30% higher. Um, and if you can maintain that type of exercise, it may decrease increase fracture risk down the line. So this is an example of a patient that I helped take care of years ago. I know at a lot of eating disorder conferences, we don't like to show images, but you'll have to bear with me, because I think this is really illustrative of some of the stuff that we can see and how this ends up crossing disciplines. So this is a patient that was seen in sports medicine. Her father was her coach. He said, you are doing so well, and we want to get you recruited to go to your favorite college, Division I, have you run, but I've noticed some other athletes seem to be a little bit thinner than you, so maybe we can just get you to lose just a few pounds, but they'll help speed you up. So he actually loved his daughter, was well intended, and so you can see what happened to her by January. She did get faster, and so she kept going down that road, and by June she looked like that. So she gets into her favorite college, but most of the time that she was in college, she was not able to run. She fell straight into a very bad case of anorexia nervosa. She had compression fractures in her spine, and she was in and out of treatment. So this is what I try to prevent. You know, I'm at an adolescent hospital. I'm seeing these kids for sports injuries, and so I want to be thinking about this kind of thing all the time to prevent that. So what is the female athlete triad? How many of you have ever heard of it? Awesome. So for those of you who haven't, um, basically this term came out of a group at uh, the American College of Sports Medicine, an interest group that had seen this correlation between disordered eating, um, eating disorders, and then a decrease in having normal menstrual cycles, eventually no menstrual cycles, amenorrhea, and then a correlation with osteoporosis. So this group in 1992 saw this correlation and said, we really need to be doing more about it. We should write a position statement. 1997, they, they, they made this position statement, coined this term, and talked about the triad. They then updated their uh, position statement in 2007, and they said, well, now we should really be thinking it not so much about disordered eating or an eating disorder it can actually be this low energy availability. So some people are just inadvertently not getting enough calories in for what they need to for their exercise. Um, and now we know it's a DSM-5 criteria, but back then they were basically saying it's not just DSM-4 criteria. In terms of amenorrhea, it doesn't have to be complete loss of cycles for months and months. It can be um, anovulatory defects, so a lack of ovulation. It can be a, um, a narrow luteal phase. So there's also lots of different types of menstrual dysfunction. And this all starts up in the brain, up in the hypothalamus, because as GnRH isn't being produced and isn't being released normally because of the lack of energy. And then the last thing is it doesn't have to be full-on osteoporosis. It could certainly be a few stress fractures. It could be low bone density, but not quite as bad as osteoporosis. So we like to think of it now as a continuum. At the far end of the com uh, continuum, all these things interact. You have a nice, healthy athlete. They eat a normal amount of food. They're doing weight-bearing exercise. They get their period. They have great bones. But a lot of our patients seem to fall kind of in the middle there, and they're on their way down to the other end. And we want to catch them when they might be presenting with just one thing. So I might screen a patient because they have multiple stress fractures. I want to ask them about their menstrual cycles. I want to find out what their bone density is and kind of nip this in the bud. Um, what are the, what's the prevalence of the triad? So there have been a lot of different review studies. Um, I highlighted the things in red because I think it really depends on how you do the study. I think any of us who've worked with eating disorder patients know that a lot of the numbers look lower until you really get into it and you see how the studies were done. Um, so for example, menstrual disorder and disordered, disordered eating, the spread was from 2.7 to 50%. Was that because in one study they just asked the patients, do you have normal menstrual cycles? You do? Swell. Okay, great. Or did they actually do some labs and actually determine that there were menstrual abnormalities. So um, a th one thing that I think is a pretty impressive number, this was done by Ann Hoke out in Wisconsin. She looked at a bunch of high school varsity female athletes and found that up to 78 percent of them had one or more component of the triad. So this is something we should be thinking about all the time when we're dealing with our female athletes. So low energy availability, um, it could be an eating disorder, it could be one of the DSM-5 criteria that we're talking about, or it could be disordered eating. They could have restrictive eating, they could be fasting, they could be trying to make weight and cutting out carbs for part of the year, they could be using diet pills, laxatives, it can be a whole gamut of things. Um, but we have these other two terms that are not official terms that are sometimes used in the sports community. Um, have you guys ever heard of these things, anorexia athletica or orthorexia nervosa? 
I think they're things that we have heard before. So anorexia athletica is basically applying um, some of the behaviors of anorexia. They don't fit all of the characteristics of anorexia and bulimia, but it's specifically in an athlete. And then orthorexia are these individuals who take their concerns about eating healthy foods extremely seriously. These are vegetarians, our vegans, our people that, as was mentioned earlier today, they think they should be gluten-free, um, but they haven't actually been tested for celiac. And so it becomes a slippery slope because they're eliminating a lot of foods so the low energy availability concept really was born back by Ann Laux, who's out in Ohio. And she did some great studies looking at a bunch of women. She had them in um, a calorimeter, so they were in a hospital setting. It was a very controlled lab setting. And she decreased their calories and was able to calculate exactly how much they were exercising and was able to measure their hormone levels and see when they started to have abnormalities in their LH and their FSH, mm -hmm. their hormone levels. Based on that, we have now extrapolated what she found. And so now people kind of use this magic number of 30. 30, there we go. Um, and that was, again, you have to keep in mind, in adult women, they were recreational athletes. So we talk about 30 as this is this magic number that we should have. And it's dietary energy intake minus exercise energy expenditure normalized to fat-free mass. So energy availability, you take the energy intake, you subtract how much they burned, you divide it by their fat-free mass, and they should have at least 30. Well, 30 is a ballpark, and I think for our adolescents, we probably need to be a lot higher than that. There have been no studies in adolescents for us to determine the exact number of calories, the exact energy availability that they need, but I would argue that if you have a kid who's supposed to be growing, it's probably higher than this. But let's look at this example. So this is a patient of mine, great kid, did not have eating disorder mentality. She simply thought, 2,000 calories seems like an appropriate amount of food for me to get. That seems normal based on what I've read online. And so she was getting 2,000 calories in a day. She had healthy fats, she had protein, she had carbs. She wasn't restricting any types of food. And when she went for a run, she might burn on a slow day that's not a super hard workout, 600 kilocals in that workout. And then the fat-free mass, we can get that off of a DEXA. So if a person orders a bone density scan with a DEXA, you can actually request <laughs> that you can get body composition. It's a very accurate way to get body composition measurement. So her fat-free mass was 51. So here's a girl who has the best intention. She's come to see me because someone told her to because she wasn't getting her period. And she just happened to get 27.5 kilocals per keg of fat-free mass per day. She's my easiest patient because all she needed was some education about nutrition and how much food to get in, and we were able to correct this. This barely ever happens. Obviously, we know it's much more complicated in most situations. But I love these. These are my easy ones. So what's the prevalence of low energy availability and or eating disorders in this population of athletes? Somewhere between 15 to 62%. Again, why is there this huge spread? Well, it depends how the studies were conducted. Did somebody ask all the high school coaches just to have the kids raise their hand if they had an eating disorder? Or was it that they actually had to go to student health, they had to do some different questionnaires, they had somebody who actually conducted the questionnaire and they could kind of tell if the person was getting a little timid about how they were answering. So I think when you do these things a little more in depth, the number really does get closer to 62%. Who gets eating disorders? We all know this, anybody. But what are the increased risks? So certainly women and then athletes. So combine that, female athletes. Female athletes in aesthetic and weight class sports. Um, people who have started sports specific training early in life. So I see so many kids whose parents think they're going to the Olympics. The kids think that they're going to the Olympics. I had a patient um, a couple months ago where the kid told me she was 14 and a half, she said she was going to the Olympics and I asked her in what sport and her father also said she was going to the Olympics and they looked at each other and they said we don't know yet. <laughs> <laughs> so that's scary. Um, Certainly transitions, traumatic events can be triggers, and then pressure to reduce weight, improve sports performance. That slide earlier, that father absolutely had the best interests of his kid as far as he could tell. He wanted her to be able to run really effectively. He thought maybe she needed to lose weight so that she could improve her sports performance. He had no idea what he was causing by some of his comments to her. Appearance or performance? So around the world, about two times the number of young women as men at every decile of BMI perceive themselves to be overweight. These things get more depressing as you read down. Um, the disproportion actively trying to lose weight is even higher, and it increases as BMI goes down. So the thinner they get, the more they want to lose weight. And almost nine times as many lean women as lean men are actively trying to lose weight. So women are more, more into this. Um, the last bullet depresses me the most because this is how I can usually get my patients to finally buy in. So if this doesn't work, I'm really bummed out. More young female athletes report improvement of appearance rather than improvement of performance as a reason for dieting. That stinks because I want to really be able to focus on you're going to get slower, you're going to get injured more, you're not going to recover as well. Um, but a lot of them are really focused on the appearance and so it takes a while for them to remember, wait a minute, I'm an athlete. Yeah, that's exactly right. I want to be healthy. I want to be fast. 
Um, so you have to change this whole concept of why they were even trying to lose weight to begin with. Okay. 20 years ago, um, another great researcher, Sungut Borgen, did a study. Again, this is old, but I think it's still relevant. She asked a bunch of athletes who had eating disorders, what do you think it was that really got you started in this? First one is not surprising, prolonged periods of dieting. The second one I think is really important to remember. Any of you who have been athletes can relate to this. A new coach. So you're on a team, you have a great relationship with the coach, you're the best athlete there, all of a sudden the coach disappears and there's some new person. Now you feel like you have to really buckle down and prove yourself again to show how valued you are on this team and why it's important that you keep your exact place there. So that's like another parent, that's like a, the father figure, a mother figure when a coach is um, in that situation and the coach has just been replaced. All these other wins, ones are things that you would probably see in any patient with an eating disorder. They're all triggers and things that could get people going. Menstrual cycle. So we're going to talk about menstrual cycle. Um, just as a refresher, the beginning part of the bleed is the beginning of menses. That's day one of the menstrual cycle. Then there's the, this follicular phase. And basically, during the follicular phase, there's a buildup of the endometrial lining that happens from estrogen. So estrogen, estradiol, that's what maintains, that's what, um, sorry, brings and builds up the lining. Then there's ovulation and the corpus luteum releases progesterone and progesterone maintains the lining and keeps it from sloughing off. If there's not a pregnancy, then the corpus luteum involutes and then the progesterone dramatically drops and that dramatic drop is what causes a slough. So when we talk about different people and how they go to their GYN to get a different birth control and why there are these different forms, a lot of times it's because, oh, they had breakthrough bleeding. Well, they may not have had enough progesterone in their pill or they weren't building up their lining enough. So that's why we have all these different formulations. Um, as we mentioned earlier, putting some patient like this on the pill is not the answer, but that's just the answer in terms of what we're talking about in terms of the cycle. So where does this all start? The hypothalamus re releases GnRH, gonadotropin-releasing hormone, and that signals to the pituitary to make FSH and LH, and that's what then tells the ovary to make estradiol and progesterone. So they're normal signals that happen all day long that are occurring that start up there in the brain. Dr. Manzoros over at uh, BI did a study looking at what do prepubertal levels of LH and FSH look like and what do we see in normal adulthood and what do we see then in hypothalamic amenorrhea or girls who aren't getting their menstrual cycles because of their low energy intake. And what he found was that those people that aren't eating enough, these triad patients, look a lot like prepuberty. They just have these really low releases of FSH and LH rather than this, this pulsatile pattern that we should see every 10 or 20 minutes. So what's the prevalence of menstrual dysfunction? Again, look at the huge spread. Depends how it was, it was done. Do you guys get your period? Great. That's 3.4% of my team. Or was it that they actually got their levels checked? The second bullet, I think, was a great study. I don't think we'll ever be so lucky as to get patients like this in any of our studies. But um, Mary Jean D'Souza at Penn State actually got runners to give urine samples every single morning for 90 days. It's awesome. Um, so what she found was basically they checked a whole bunch of fancy hormones and they found that the recreational eumenorrheic athletes, so these are people that run for fun, who get their period every month, those people, in 78% of them, they had at least one of three menstrual cycle abnormalities, either a luteal phase defect or anovulation. So this I'd like to tell to my patients who are say 34, come in to see me, they're training for the Boston Marathon, they have a pretty normal BMI, they seem very healthy, but they want to get pregnant. And they're like, why can't I get pregnant? I get my period every Every month and I'm really fit and I'm taking my prenatals, they might be one of these people that's missing maybe 150, 200 extra calories a day to really keep their body healthy enough to um, have able to, to actually ovulate. So again, this is the study that Ann Lauchs did, and I think you can see these nice graphs. Basically what she did is she started people at 50 kilocals per keg of fat-free mass per day, dropped it down to 40, dropped it down to 30, and below 30, she started seeing these huge changes in LH frequency and amplitude. It was really impressive just to see this nice linear relationship. Um, so what's the interrelationship of uh, the different components of the triad? A lot of doctors and a lot of people in the community emphasize estrogen. Oh, you need estrogen. Let's give you a pill because it's all about the estrogen and the estrogen is going to fix your bones. Well, there have been a ton of studies by the group at Mass General, by the groups out in Penn State, by the people all, people all over the country looking at this, and we found that there's a lot of different hormones and a lot of different things that are contributing to bone density. So if you look at this slide, the things in green are really good for bones, the things in red are pretty bad for bones, and all those things are messed up in this female athlete tribe population. So for example, you have low energy availability, BMI goes down, fat mass goes down, fat actually in and of itself produces estrogen, but then lean mass in and of itself 
pulls on the bones and the tissue, the muscle tissue itself, and the pulling of the muscle tissue has an effect of increasing bone density. Um, these people have low lean mass. We know that there's a decrease in FSH and LH, and therefore a decrease in estradiol, a decrease in androgens. Um, androgens are in and of themselves good for bones as well. There's a decrease in insulin, glucose, IGF-1, which is a form of growth hormone, um, T3, which is a thyroid hormone, and in leptin, both of which are important for bones. And then these are some of the metabolic appetite regulating hormones. So we found in this population there's an increase in fasting, PYY, ghrelin, cortisol, and growth hormone resistance. The point of this slide is not for you to remember all of these things, but to know it's complicated and all of these things are affected by this low energy availability. So let's talk about bone mass. So the third component of the triad is what happens to their bones, their osteoporosis, are they at higher risk for this, are they getting fractures? So a really uh, common statement that I make in almost every one of my talks is this top one. 90% of a woman's peak bone mass is accrued by the age of 18. This is why we have to get on top of this in adolescence. It's not okay for a girl to first get her period at age 18. She's, the red line is what will happen to that girl. So she's missing that huge accrual of bone mass that happens as an adolescent, and she's gonna be at a lower peak bone mass. So we already know the normal trajectory is that you have an increase during adolescence, there's a slight increase during your 20s, people just hold on to the bones that they have in their 30s, then they hit menopause and there's an abrupt drop, and then it kinda slows down. So if they never get to that good peak bone mass, they could get osteoporosis when they're 30. This is a super busy slide. It's on your thumb drive. You don't need to remember this. The only point of this is there's all these different organizations, the World Health Organization, the International Society of Clinical Densitometry, the American College of Sports Medicine, and they've all these different terms. A few years ago, we couldn't use the term osteoporosis in young people. It just wasn't the proper term. It was supposed to be low bone mineral density or low bone mass for age, below the expected range for age with other risk factors. We can now say osteoporosis in kids. If they have a Z-score, which is comparing their bone density to people of their age group, so it's a standard deviation, if their standard deviation is negative two or worse, and they have risk factors for fracture, or they have a significant history of fracture, we can say osteoporosis. And that term now is pretty scary to a parent if they find out that their 17-year-old has osteoporosis. So what's the prevalence of low bone mineral density? Doesn't surprise you, there's a spread. Here it's a little interesting. It really depends on the sport. So if I have a gymnast, and they're classically people that have delay in their development, they are people that don't get their menstrual period, they're often um, restricting in their food, their bone density is actually pretty good because they are pounding on everything. But you take a swimmer doing the exact same thing, their bones are horrible. So it really is sport specific. We see that the spines are a little bit better in rowers. We see that the hips are a little bit better in runners. So where is the impact happening? Um, but in general, if you compare that athlete to another athlete in that same sport, the one that doesn't get their menstrual cycle, the one who has low energy availability will have worse bone density in general. Uh, we're doing work over at Mass General looking at other ways to assess bone. So looking at bone microarchitecture. When you look at a bone density scan, it's a two-dimensional image. It doesn't give us all the info that we need. Um, depending on the body habitus of somebody, if they're really big or if they're really small, it could overestimate or underestimate bone density. So we're also looking at this cool thing called microarchitecture done with high-resolution peripheral QCT. All that fancy wording is basically to say what we can see now is in athletes in general, they have an increased cross-sectional bone at the tibia. So we've looked at all these adolescent running athletes, and because of all that weight bearing, the tibia is actually wider. If you think about it, it makes sense, because then if they're putting all this pounding, they have a, a bigger moment of inertia. It's not like running on a skinny bone, it's like running on a wider bone. But in the amenorrheic athletes, we found that the trabecular number, and those little white things in there, all the little trabeculi, the number of those trabeculi, um, and the thickness, the outside part of the bone, actually were lower in the amenorrheic athletes. And the, therefore, the, the total and the trabecular bone density was lower. And then there's this cool engineering program you can apply to these images to actually calculate how strong is the bone. So basically, it's used in terms of figuring out how strong structures are, buildings are, and they can, we can now apply these to microarchitecture in terms of bones. And when you apply this, it's called FEA, finite elemental analysis. We see that those changes in trabecular number, those changes in, in bone density, actually decrease their strength and it makes it easier, it's easier for the bone to fail. What's even more interesting is if you look at this and you compare these numbers and then you look at the bone density, it doesn't always perfectly correlate with the bone density. So sometimes I'll see somebody in clinic 
and they have low energy availability, they have menstrual dysfunction, they came to see me for stress fractures, I checked their bone density and it's actually fairly normal. I kind of hate that because then they don't believe me, but um, I keep them in the back of my mind. At some point, I hope we have this as a clinical tool because I bet you if I did microarchitecture assessment on them, their microarchitecture would be different. So consequences of aspects of the triad, we all know all the eating disorder ones, they're horrible, um, so I don't have to reiterate that. But I think what I try to emphasize, like I said earlier, is I try to emphasize on this yellow box, its effects on performance, injury, and recovery. I try to remind my athletes that they are athletes, that's why they're doing this sport, it's because that's what they love to do. And if they're gonna have this disordered eating pattern, then they're gonna have decreased energy, they're gonna have earlier fatigue, they're gonna have decreased coordination, concentration, speed, they're gonna actually get other Injuries. It's not just about bone. We know now that they actually have increases in muscle strains and sprains. Um, they tend to get sick more frequently, and it's harder for them to recover with their workouts and their competitions. I have had a lot of athletes who come in to see me because their parents have dragged them in. They're the captain of their team. They're doing really well. They're the fastest one on the team, and they're in this situation. They do not want to believe me. They think I'm crazy. They think I don't understand anything about sports, mm -hmm. and they just think I'm full of it. So they leave. The parents are frustrated. and. Fortunately, the parents are nice enough and, and keep my card or something, and these kids show up again. They show up in a year. They show up in a year and a half because now they've had two tibial stress fractures or they've had a femoral neck stress fracture. Now their numbers are starting to slide. Their performance is starting to decline. So often you don't catch them right away or they're, they're not gonna buy into it right away because they're doing well. These are the kids who are the A students who are really devoted. They're doing great. They're 16. Everything's going great. It hasn't hit them yet. So you gotta try to keep that relationship for when they're ready to come back. Um, this is just a term I wanna introduce to you. Those of you who haven't heard it, it's fairly new. So it was started by the International Olympic Committee earlier this year, and it's called REDS, or Relative Energy Deficiency in Sport. Now there's a lot of politics right now about do we call it female athlete triad, do we move over to REDS, there's different organizations doing different things, but I think what the IOC was getting at is, number one, should we use a term that has less stigma? It is horrible that the female athlete triad acronym is FAT. That was just poor planning. So it's also just for females. And we know that there are male athletes who have energy deficiency. We also know that there's Paralympic athletes who struggle with different things related to food. So the IOC was saying, let's keep triad, because most of the work has been in triad, and it's been going on for over 25 years. But should we be expanding it, and should we be talking about the other systems? We know there's hematologic, cha hematologic changes. We know that there's metabolic changes. We know that there's cardiovascular changes. So maybe we shouldn't just be focusing on bone, and maybe we should tell people, hey, we're screening you for reds. That sounds a little bit better. So that's the point of that. And they also, uh, the IOC is calling for more research so that we can look into these other things, look at the performance changes, and let's focus on performance in these athletes. So diagnosis. An athlete with one component of the triad should be evaluated for the other two. Um, I think it's a great gateway to look into these other things when one of those situations presents itself. So low energy availability, I highlight stress fracture because I work in a sports clinic. So my orthopedic surgeons do not want to talk about this, but they know a stress fracture is a gateway to get this started. So they may not get into it too much. They might say stress fracture, oh wait, Ackerman said something about bone density and periods. Okay, I'm gonna send them to Ackerman just to double check that stuff. So we want to suspect low energy availability if they've had significant weight loss, a change in performance, change in mood, frequent injury, illness, a stress fracture. Um, low bone density if you have a DEXA, menstrual dysfunction, or if they had an eating questionnaire, that would be too easy. Menstrual dysfunction, I think about it when I know that someone struggled with an eating disorder or disordered eating patterns. If they have a low BMI, if they have a delay in developing secondary sexual characteristics, and again, when we're talking about adolescents, like Kim said, thinking about their growth curve. Have they fallen off their growth curve? And again, a stress fracture. Low bone density, a stress fracture. I'm gonna think about their bone density. Again, eating disorders, menstrual dysfunction, malabsorption, do they have celiac? Have they been told they have irritable bowel? You know, we know about inflammatory bowel, but some of them just say, well, I have some irritable bowel issues. So that's kind of a, 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 fl a red flag for me. So workup for triad, um, I, this is by not, not at all extensive here. I didn't want to overwhelm you with all the labs and things that I do. But basically, we want to take the time to get the growth history, spend some time on diet. 
I can't ask them everything there is about nutrition. So we bring in a nutritionist, a sports dietitian, somebody who can really get into it. Training, if there's an exercise physiologist around, that's awesome. Otherwise, I'll tease that, that out as a physician. Um, are they training seven days a week? Are they training and supplementing their team sport with other workouts? Medical conditions, family history, reproductive history, stresses, medications, and then medical testing really depends on what other things I'm worried about. So if they have a fracture, obviously I'm thinking about x-rays, MRI, bone scan to try to figure out how many fractures. I had a girl once who came in to see me who had pain in about eight different places. And so getting one x-ray wasn't going to do anything. They might have been stress fractures. Those won't show up on x-ray. So I actually did a bone scan, which is different than a bone density scan, and she had um, a calcaneal fracture on the left, she had a fibular fracture, these are all stress fractures, calcaneal, bilateral fibular, one tibia, pelvic ramus, um, she had I think seven total. So when people come in, come in with these aches and they fit the profile, sometimes you have to think of some other testing. Easy to get a bone density, it's covered by insurance, and then labs, it depends what other things I'm worried about. A lot of my athletes are very good athletes and one of the things we see a lot in women athletes who are very competitive is they could also have polycystic ovarian syndrome. So we think of PCOS classically as the overweight kid who has hirsutism, has hair and, and male patterns, um, or has a lot of acne. But the kind of PCOS I see is the really buff, thin, strong female who probably has a little bit of competitive advantage because she has slightly elevated androgens. So it falls into that community fairly frequently. Treatment, um, treatment in general, again, like everyone is saying, it's really multidisciplinary. The more people you can get involved, the more people that can be sending the right messages to the athlete, the better. And now potential treatments for triad in terms of medications. And I think Kim touched on this a little bit. And basically, um, OCPs, the data out there is really limited. The studies have been small. Some showed an increase in bone density. Some showed a decrease. Some showed no change. So that's because there's different formulations. There's all sorts of reasons. So OCPs are not the obvious answer. Androgens or IGF-1, um, there have been studies with using testosterone and DHEA, which is a type of androgen, and they did replace, do this in anorexia nervosa patients. So not in female athlete tried per se, but in anorexia nervosa patients. And there wasn't really a change in bone mineral density, there was just a change in bone turnover markers. So that doesn't help us a lot yet. Um, Steve Grinspoon at MGH looked at IGF-1 plus a birth control pill in anorexia patients, and there was some good success with that in terms of lumbar bone mineral density, but again, this hasn't been done in young people and it hasn't been done in triad patients, so it's not my go-to thing yet. Leptin, uh, Chris Manzoros, who I mentioned earlier, is really into leptin. He's looking at metroleptin, which is a recombinant form of leptin. And basically what he did is give it to these hypothalamic amenorrheic women. And he did see an increase in the spine density, which is great, except he saw that in four people because that's how many dropouts there were for different reasons. So we have an N of four. And unfortunately, the major side effect of leptin is weight loss and a decrease in appetite. So that's a tough one to use in this population. Bisphosphonates, in general, this is a medicine we use with great success in postmenopausal women, but unfortunately it stays in the bones for at least 10 years and it could have teratogenic effects. So I certainly don't want to take a 23-year-old and put him on a bisphosphonate and she, whoops, accidentally gets pregnant at 27 um, because that can have really bad fetal complications. So that's a no. The only time that, that, that I have ever used that was in one patient. And again, I'm a bone specialist. I'd encourage you if you're even thinking about using this to have it be in conjunction with an endocrinologist was in a patient who'd had multiple vertebral fractures. So we had to do something because her body was just collapsing on itself. Teriparatide, which is Forteo, another great agent used in postmenopausal women. Unfortunately, we can't use it in the growing skeleton. Um, one of our colleagues at MGH, Puna Fazelli, did a study in anorexia patients that were premenopausal. They had great improvement in their bone density, um, but again, it hasn't been done in young people. We can't do it in young people because in the growing skeleton, it's, it's contraindicated. So transdermal estrogen. We're currently doing a study looking at transdermal estrogen, and that's because estrogen, as it's absorbed orally, shuts down IGF-1, which is a growth hormone, as I was telling you, which is good for bone. If you take it as a patch, it doesn't have that negative feedback to IGF-1. And so Madhu Misra, my mentor over at MGH, did this study in anorexia patients who were adolescents and actually found that, it, that taking transdermal estrogen make it unopposed, don't do unopposed estrogen, but have them take oral progesterone at the same time, and they actually had an increase in bone density. So we're now doing this study in female athlete triad patients who are adolescents, and we need a few more. So if you have any patients that you're interested in sending this study, you can certainly look at the website. We also have some handouts out there. But we're just trying to find some sort of treatment that we could do while we're trying to get their energy availability 
availability improved while we're trying to address the eating disorder so that their skeleton actually has a chance while they're still young. Um, finally, this is the Female Athlete Triad Coalition's return to play approach. So another organization I'm involved in is called the Female Athlete Triad Coalition, and this year they put out these guidelines. What are we supposed to do with these athletes? How do we decide? What do you do with student health when you see somebody like this? So they tried to actually come up with an equation. We're now testing these guidelines to see if they work. Are we going to be over flagging people? Are we going to be restricting people way too much? Nobody knows because these have not been validated. So I would look at these guidelines and say they're a good start. It's a good thing to be thinking about. Okay, does this person have any dietary restrictions? Is their BMI above 18.5 or greater than 90% um, you know, expected weight? But this is all a gestalt, and you will find, if we had more time, I would plug in a few cases where you would see it's not always a perfect answer because this is a point system, and none of our patients work exactly when you put them into a point system. So what they want you to do is add up. You get zero points if you're in this column, one point for each of those in the middle, and two on the right. And then if you're zero to one point, you get full clearance. If you're in the middle, provisional limited clearance, two to five points. I've seen a ton of athletes who have three points and they're totally healthy. Um, and what does provisional or limited mean? That's hard for people to decide too. And then restricted from, from training or competition, that one's a little bit easier because if they're scoring a lot of points, obviously we want to be super cautious. Um, so future directions, uh, we definitely have to determine the efficacy of those guidelines to make sure that we're applying them appropriately. Um, I've given some talks this fall to some various colleges. Um, Princeton and Dartmouth are both trying to do a program. They're calling it the REDS program, so they're not calling it the FAT program, but they're applying the, the return to play protocol to see if it's working. Um, we need to compare different treatment approaches. There are definitely people in this room that think that athletes who are suffering from disordered eating or eating disorders should not exercise at all. There's other people who believe we should allow them to do some exercise as a reward so they continue to come back to see us and we can monitor them. Who's right? You know, we have to keep seeing these patients and start comparing outcomes. Definitive hormonal and other drug therapy studies, that's why we're trying to see if there's something else we can use while we're counseling these people. And then we also want to look into other consequences, consequences of energy deficiency in this population and other populations so we have more of an argument about why this is bad. So with that, I will wrap it up. These are some resources. They're on your thumb drive. You can always email me any questions. And that's me. Okay. <laughs>